Hello and welcome to Catholic Bites, a podcast for busy Catholics. This is Father Conrad, and I have with me again as a guest, Father Jeff Kirby from the Diocese of Charleston, South Carolina. Thank you so much for coming, Father Kirby. My pleasure. Thank you, Father. Of course. And today uh, we're going to talk about, you have a book called We Are the Lords, A Catholic Guide to Difficult End-of-Life Questions. And end-of-life questions, frankly, I know in my life has been, it's a, it's a struggle. And you are at someone's deathbed and um, you know, a family member, a friend, and you just feel helpless and don't know what to do. And there's all these complicated medical things and you want to know if I'm doing the right thing for the, for the person, am I doing the right thing morally? So where, where do we, how do we make sense of all that? Yeah, so I, I very much uh, can, can understand uh, that sense of being overwhelmed, um, both from personal experience, pastoral experience, um, both as a priest, uh, as a moral theologian, and then having served on ethics boards of hospitals. Uh, the questions are vast, multifaceted, and often very complicated uh, and, and, and chaotic, uh, depending on, on the family dynamics. So where, where to turn? I mean, the church has an immense wealth of wisdom. And I want to stress that to people who are in difficult moments, especially maybe Catholics who aren't as faithful to practicing the faith or fallen away Catholics who might approach the church with some hesitation. Like The church has great wealth in these difficult moments in order to clarify what is morally right and what is morally wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's a great clarity and a great help. So the wisdom of the church is there. Of course, she, the church gives a lot of... Uh, documents and explanations, and and I hope that people will find in my book, We Are the Lords, a simple, practical, easy uh, to read uh, guide. So, for example, in the book, if someone were to pick it up, uh, they had urgent questions, they're in the ICU, or they're in the emergency room, or they're at the uh, bed of a dying family member, Uh, I I say in the intro, go right to the book, to uh, chapter 7. Chapter 7 addresses the 25 plus main questions. Uh, most of the questions deal with nutrition, hydration, mm-hmm. informed consent, or pain uh, management. Uh, those are like the three main areas. But then if they have more time, you know, uh, or they're just trying to form themselves better in terms of, of church teaching, then the book develops some of the more central themes. So I think there are a lot of resources from the wisdom of the church, and I hope this book uh, will prove to be one of them. What are some of the key principles, you know, you, you said if you just want to be formed, it's helpful to be formed in these things in advance. So that way, when the moment comes, you, you have this kind of wealth to draw back on. What are some of the key principles that the average Catholic should know um, regarding your typical end-of-life uh, issues? Yeah, so um, there are three main principles. Um, I, I codify them in, in three uh, that I think that everyone needs to, to keep in front of them when there's any moral discernment, but especially end-of-life moral discernment. The first is that there is an objective moral order. That means that mm-hmm. there are moral teachings that are outside of us. Two plus two equals four, not because I feel that or think that, mm-hmm. not because I agree or disagree, it's just the way it is. An oak tree is an oak tree, even if I would prefer that it be a tulip. So as we can acknowledge, there are things outside of our feelings or our own thought processes or our Mm. own preferences, uh, just as we can see that in other areas of reality. So there's also a moral order that is outside of us. If we want peace, the tranquility of order, then we have to try to recognize that and not um, bypass or break that moral code, that that objective moral order. So that's the Mm. first thing is moral truth. Second is the acknowledgement of our human vocation that we all share this beautiful gift of being a human being. That means there's certain ways that we're called to treat each other. So as Christians, we would call these the works of mercy. That if I see a fellow human being hungry, I try to give him food to the degree that I'm able. If I see a fellow human being alone, I try to give them companionship to the degree that I'm able. And that doesn't end at the end of life. So if someone is unable to feed themselves... I have to give them food and water, even if it's artificially administered. I can't mm-hmm. stop someone to death, right? No. I can't say to someone, well, I'm sorry that you know your adult diaper is full, but you know what? You're going to die anyway, so I'm not going to waste my time cleaning it. Or mm. I'm not going to rotate your body to prevent bed sores because you know, you're know you dying anyway. Like There's a violation there to our human vocation because as fellow human beings, we are called to care for one another. So mm-hmm. there's that part. And then from there is our particular vocation. What has God called for us to do in this life? In particular, the responsibilities and the duties that come with that. So whether it's family or parish or to those, for example, a medical doctor who's the only doctor in a certain area, 
um, that care uh, for people who are sick and so on. So that's the second. And the third principle would be ordinary or extraordinary. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out is something morally obligatory, that's ordinary care, or morally optional, which is extraordinary care. And that can be very difficult because for a lot of people, they might be at first caught off guard when they say, wait a minute, are you trying to say that the exact same procedure can be morally obligatory for one person, but morally optional for another? Yes, because in moral discernment, when you have one case, you have one case, right? The state of affairs pertaining and surrounding that case is very significant. So, for example, if you had an elderly gentleman, say in his 90s, who had multiple problems of cancer, and was being kept alive on a machine to assist his lungs, uh, would that be extraordinary? Based on the scenario I just gave, I would say most likely. But what if that exact same procedure was being used for a two-month-old whose lungs were still being developed and was simply mm. being assistance? Well, the exact same procedure would be morally obligatory in the case of the child, whereas morally optional in the case of this person who is of older age. So. I think those three principles can be such helpful guideposts to us in our moral discernment. Yeah, and it, it seems to me that um, it all kind of it, it narrows down to to what you said in that second point, which is the the who are these people? You know, they're they're human beings, and human beings are are children of God and and have dignity regardless um, their ability, their age, their their. Um, uh, intelligence, their their development, where they're at in life and what stage, that there's a, a common duty to care for people who are our brothers and sisters. And and it seems to me that that, that kind of really shapes how we should approach um uh end of life questions in general. Yes, and 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 allows us to really experience the beauty and the power of human dignity. Mm. I look at another human being and say that that's a person who has a narrative of life, uh, a collection of experiences, a network of loved ones, uh, you know, and, and, and was created and, and, and known to be created by God forever. Uh, we begin to realize uh, the real splendor of what it means to be a human being. Then we are profoundly moved to protect that dignity of our, of, of our fellow human beings, of our, of our brothers and sisters. So very much, I think, um, you know, that, that part has to be emphasized. You know, Pope St. John Paul II, he said that if, if we are moved to the authentic worship of God, we will concurrently experience a profound sense of awe at ourselves. Yeah. Very much we see that here. Now, what would you say to someone who says, in a difficult situation, maybe there's been a horrible accident, maybe there's been a, a very severe disease, but that that person's life is no longer, you know, they wouldn't, they're, maybe they're out, but they, they wouldn't want to live in this situation. Why don't, you know, why do I have to help continue that process? Or, or uh, how, do, how do we make, a, what do we make of that kind of current societal discussion surrounding, well, whose life is worth living? And, and, and is a life in this situation just totally ventilated and, and, and artificial? Is that worth living? Yes, I think that, you know, at the core of, of, of that kind of, uh, lead-in is, is very much um, a cultural tendency, a, a predominant cultural view uh, that the elderly, the sick, those with special needs, those who have uh, severe disabilities, those who have been in severe accidents or the disabled are burdens to society. Mm. And I cannot tell you how profoundly dangerous this is because the Western culture, which is so unique from other parts of the world, like Western culture, which has thrived in terms of human rights and the arts and literature and human society and scientific development, it's all happened because of the foundational Judeo-Christian belief in the dignity of every human being. And from that, the acknowledgement that the sick and those in need are not burdens, but are blessings and opportunities for greater service from civil society. When a society has forgotten that and turns on the most vulnerable, right, and mm -hmm. begins to say, you are a burden, and people begin to believe that, right? Yeah. I, I see older parishioners who say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a burden to my children. You know what I tell them? I say, no, be a burden to them. <laughs> <laughs> you, know I mean? you draw out every possible virtue from your adult children, right? Um, because, you know, you know, love is about carrying the burdens of others. And, and we want to clarify 
uh, that, you know, when we speak about burden, while we can talk about caregiving can be burdensome, uh, to our main point, uh, and no human being is a burden. We would never use that term. And so I think in, in the situation that's been presented that you've described, the first thing we have to identify is this notion that somehow this life is a burden, this life should not be here, this life is not worth living. And I would say that in a civil society, the first challenge that, to that would be, but that's a gift. Yeah. A person will yeah. bring something and contribute something to our society that no one else can bring. This person will draw forth a virtue and a creativity from us that no one else will be able to. And this life is worth defending and cherishing and welcoming. That's, yeah, oh, so true. It's so, and so important. Now, maybe we can turn briefly at the end from the kind of theoretical to the more practical. I know there's so many different things. There's, like you mentioned earlier, informed consent. There's do not resuscitate orders. There's, you know, powers of attorney. There's all these different things that you, that people kind of swirl around the end of life issues um, that people are confronted with. And oftentimes they're confronted with very quickly at, at the end of life because they haven't thought about it before. What, what, what are kind of some key practical things people can do to prepare um, God willing, not for a while, but prepare for, for any eventuality. Yes, I think that some of the essential things is, is first of all, to, to read uh, you know, good books or church documents on uh, life or the end of life, and, and to really themselves to be uh, very well uh, instructed, catechized on these areas. Secondly, I think it's so important that people do uh, you know, the, the hard work of discerning and finding a true medical proxy. So medical proxy is if, if we lose our ability to make decisions, um, this person will be empowered both by law and by moral truth to make decisions on our behalf. So the medical proxy, sometimes called a surrogate, is so important. So oftentimes what do parents do, older people? Oh, well, it's my oldest child. Yeah. Well, is your oldest child able to do this? Can they emotionally live with having to make these tough decisions? Do they have the temperament, right? Do they merit or, or receive financial gain? you know, from, mm. uh, from this area. So will that influence them or not? Like, there's so many questions that have to be done. Like choosing a medical proxy is really something that is a process. And I really, I, I encourage, you know, people here in the parish and other places at conferences and so on to do that work because you want your medical proxy to make, to know very clearly uh, where you stand because here's what happens in the hospital. And having sit on the ethics board, I've seen this time and again, when someone is brought in, especially in an emergency situation or in a situation where the person surprisingly loses consciousness, the thing the doctor wants to know first, who's making the decision, right? Mm. So if you have advanced directives, that's great, but advanced directives are weak because... It's just a piece of paper. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and every moral truth depends on a state of affairs that that advanced directive could not have anticipated, right? Mm -hmm. So the doctor, in, in especially in an emergency situation, will see the advanced directive as a guide to the proxy, right? Mm. So because the doctor doesn't know, well, did they change it last night? Um, the, the, the doctor, and, and as you're pointing out, the doctor can't talk to a piece of paper. So in these situations, your advanced directives are, are subordinate and in service to your proxy. So you say, mm. well, I'll appoint my cousin. I know he's not very Catholic, but I have good advanced directives. No, no, no. Like you appoint the proxy that's going to really rally your cause and, and, and defend uh, where you stand on moral issues. So I think that those two, self-instruction and then the selection of a, of a good proxy are, are good places to start. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And also, I mean, just it's always good advice for all of us, just development of the virtues within us. You know, you want someone prudent. You want someone who's courageous. You want someone who, who, who's trying to live that same life you are living the life of, of, of God and who recognizes the spark of God's love in, in your heart. And this is a, an important thing to them. That's, that's so helpful. And so, so interesting. Well, thank you so much, uh, Father Kirby. Father Kirby's book again is, um, we are the Lord's a Catholic guide to difficult end of life questions. And I really recommend it, especially for someone with family members who might have these issues or, uh, need some really practical help. Um, Thank you, Father Kirby, for joining us on Catholic Bites. My pleasure. Thank you, Father. And thank you, everyone, for listening. If you'd like to listen to more great Catholic talks by great Catholic speakers, you can find us on CatholicBitesPodcast.com or on Apple Podcasts. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs>